You know, the Montauk Project was purportedly a series of secret United States government projects conducted at Camp Hero or Montauk Air Force Station on Montauk Island, Long Island, for the purpose of developing a powerful psychological war weapon. Some think it might have been a hoax. No evidence confirming either way. In a moment, we'll talk with Stuart Swordlow about this and some other major stories on Coast to Coast AM. Of gifted, and I mean a very gifted medical intuitive, Stuart Swordlow is a clairvoyant who has the ability to see auric fields and personal archetypes as well as read DNA sequences and mind patterns. His great uncle, Yakov Swordlow, was the first president of the Soviet Union. And now get this, his grandfather helped form the Communist Party here in the United States in the 30s to ensure that his loyalty stayed with the United States. Stewart was recruited for specific government mind control experiments which enhanced his natural abilities. He spent years in service to various U.S. and foreign government agencies and special interest groups. His mind and body were used for genetic and mind control experiments which led to severe illness, broken relationships, premature kundalini activation. After several years of deep self-analysis, Stewart merged with higher levels of his multi-dimensional self which saved his life. He has authored and co-authored with his wife, Janet, several books and lectures worldwide for a variety of groups, organizations, large corporations. He is our special guest tonight on Coast to Coast. Hello, Stuart. Welcome aboard. How are you? Fine. Thank you, George. Man, you have had a varied life and a tough one. Well, that's putting it mildly. It's been very (laughs) rough. How do you bounce back from sometimes those very tough times that so many people have to endure? Well, you know, it's not a very easy process. Uh, Usually there's a lot of phases that you go through, and very often you have to hit an area where you decide uh, to either leave the planet or stay and do something better with your life. And then you have to make a choice of uh, either living, uh, hiding in the closet or going out in the world and making a difference. And so I think that's what uh, actually helped save me is to know that I had to go out there and do something, uh, but not only for myself but for everyone else in the world. Well, good for you. Tell me a little bit more than what I've just uh, given to our audience here. Well, as you mentioned, uh, my family does have a very interesting background. My uh, father's uh, uncle or my great uncle was the first president of the Soviet Union. And uh, you mentioned about my grandfather uh, starting the uh, or helping to start the Communist Party in the United States, which uh, gratefully uh, he failed to to finish that project. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But my grandmother, his wife, was also a Soviet spy during World War II, and there's a lot of interesting information we're finding out about her as well. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, my father, being embarrassed about that whole situation, uh, destroyed a lot of the materials about my grandmother, and when she passed away, there was really uh, not much we could do to find out more about her. Yeah, he would much rather have nobody know anything about what was going on, huh? Well, basically, yes, but of course they've changed all that by telling everybody everything. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Let's spend some time this hour talking about the Montauk Project, which is fascinating, and tell me about your involvement with this thing. Right. I need to preface all that by stating that Montauk was really an outgrowth of a lot of situations in the 20th century. You know, after World War II, uh, there was still a fear of what was uh, out there in the world that could affect us. The people were jittery, uh, so the uh, the powers that be created the Cold War, and then they created the situation in 1947 with the Roswell situation, which was a staged event. Most people don't understand or realize that, and that was to create. Uh, the beginning of the revelation of the presence of aliens on this planet. And to make a long story short, when you are a very small group of people who control a tremendous amount of population, armies and weapons really are not enough because you can just be overwhelmed by the population. The most brilliant thing that you can do to maintain control is to create a, a fear in the world and mind control and programming so that people follow along in a certain way, and there's no deviation from policy and procedure. And so in 1970, uh, the government uh, opened up underground uh, the Montauk base. Now, the base had been there since the late 1700s. George Washington was actually 
the first person to commission building the Montauk Lighthouse at the very end of Montauk uh, Point on Long Island. Long Island, sure. Because in those days, of course, there was a fear that the British would invade uh, North America. And so he created a small underground area where they could store uh, supplies and weapons in case Long Island was cut off from the mainland of the United States. Which was a brilliant idea. Yes, as it really truly was. And then over the years, decades and even centuries, it was added to uh, to become a very, very large underground area so that by World War II, it was actually able to hold underground or undersea uh, submarine pens. And interestingly, uh, during World War II, the people or the, the population at Montauk, which was very small at the time, uh, because it's a resort area, people are basically only there year-round uh, uh, who live there, it's a very small population, they would notice German U-boats coming in from the Atlantic, submerging, heading towards the point, and then not re-emerging until days later, but they were never stopped by any U.S. military. And it's also interesting to note that the only location in North America where the Germans actually uh, made landhead was near was in Amagansett uh, during World War II, where the German submarine actually let some spies off. They came to the east end of Long Island and made their way into New York City. And, and literally partied with people and enjoyed themselves and then went back, right? Well, actually, they were captured uh, towards the end of the war. But here's the interesting thing, is that they were sent to a federal prison in the United States, and then after the war in 1947, they were executed. Now, the war was over. There was no reason to hold them prisoner anymore, but they executed them. And so one has to wonder, what did these uh, people know that was not allowed to be told in public? Good point, because I I have never heard of an execution on this soil uh, during the, the World War II era. Beyond this, have you? Well, I have heard of, remember my background is such that I have connections to a lot of intelligence information. And unfortunately, this happens more frequently than not in the United States. Of course, it's not in mainstream media. Oh my gosh. All right. So back to the Montauk Project. So you definitely do not believe it was a hoax, as some believe, right? Well, obviously, I lived through it, so I know it's not a hoax. You know, when I hear things like that, it's a bit disturbing. It's kind of like someone telling a Holocaust victim that the concentration... It, it didn't happen. Existed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and, and you know the sensitivities about that, Stuart. Yeah, and in fact, you know, over the years, I actually, when I was working, uh, doing seminars in Oregon, I happened to meet a man who was a courier for the U.S. government during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, an elderly gentleman. And he said to me that he used to have uh, uh, briefcases chained to his arm, and he worked out of the NSA headquarters in Maryland, and he would be ferried back and forth to Montauk Point with this information, and that he knew that the place existed and that the information is in the archives of the government. All right, so uh, there are some who believe that this was an extension of that controversial Philadelphia experiment, which took place in 1943. Yes. Uh, what do you think Project Montauk was all about? Well, originally it was about... Uh, and through the years, it was about mind control and programming and creating a global system where the masses of population could be uh, manipulated. However, they did use electromagnetic equipment. Much of it was uh, created and developed by Tesla and uh, subsequently uh, um, developed past that point. And they did use uh, equipment that they had from alien technology. And so the uh, the project kind of morphed into uh, time travel, uh, electromagnetic weaponry, and genetic manipulation. It was a very wide-ranging project uh, by the time it ended in 1983. The project appeared in a lot of television shows and films. Uh, the Philadelphia Experiment film uh, dealt uh, with Montauk, uh, Stargate, SG-1. Yeah. Had similarities there. That's Our right. dear friend. A, a show people may not remember in the late 60s and early 70s called Time Tunnel which was I think, mm -hmm. based on that uh, project. Is the facility still in use? 
The facility is not in use anymore in the same capacity as it was. Uh, the last information that I had personally from it when I still lived in that area was in the early to mid-1990s when I was told it was used as a weather manipulation facility. Um, however, the mind control, time travel, all of the others no longer is no longer practiced in that area. But there are other areas in the U.S. and in other places in the world where those are still uh, continued. So, you know, now we have HARP, of course, in Alaska, which might have picked up the load. Is that possible? Well, HARP, you know, is a, is a different kind of project, and there is a sister project to HARP in northern Norway. And I recently met a, a man who was a helicopter pilot uh, in Vietnam and then was transferred to the Alaska area, and he told me that there's at least 12 facilities that are related to HARP globally. And he personally saw this in northern Alaska. I wonder if that's a reason why our weather is so screwed up, Stuart. I, I absolutely agree. What HARP is doing is creating a shield in the ionosphere over the Earth and trying to create weather manipulation so that we think there are such things as global warming when, in fact, it's just a manipulation of our weather and uh, geological events as well. Let me... Uh... Let me ask you about the success of Montauk. Do you know if they accomplished anything that was just truly extraordinary? Well, I think that they did accomplish their goal. And I and right now, 100% of the Earth is uh, affected by mind control or scalar waves that are transmitted now from satellites in space that completely ring the Earth and are enhanced by ground uh, antenna that we see a cell tower microwave transmissions so that at any moment they can transmit a mind control wave to specific areas of the earth uh, to specific people. And a lot of what's happening now with the chemtrails is also creating a web or a network around the earth like a shield or radio wiring so that it's like a grid that covers the earth and they can pinpoint very specific locations now and transmit whatever they wish to to create. Just absolutely phenomenal. It employed how many people at the time when it was at its heyday? Well, you know, in those days, I was a mere subject. I wasn't in control of anything, so I had no idea how many people were in control. But I can tell you that there were... Uh, at least hundreds of people that I used to see there, many of them in military uniforms, some of them in civilians, some of them looked like they were in scientific garb. Um, there were so many different people, and they were different at various times. There, I didn't see consistent people all the time. So I think they moved people around. But I figured out over the years, over the 13 years, all the, the people that were used in the project I estimate there had to be between 200,000 to 300,000 subjects of the experiment, and most of them did not make it. Was there? What do you mean they didn't make it? Well, what I happened? was told that less than 1% survived the experimentation. When you're bombarded with electromagnetic waves and microwaves oh. and uh, basically traumatized and tortured, uh, very few can survive that kind of life. And, in fact, uh, a lot of the subjects were children, and so they just didn't make it. Children of maybe some of the people who work there? No. These uh, initially, they used uh, orphans. They would use the children who were in foster care, uh, people who they considered to be expendable and would not be missed. Um, then later on, as the subject, as the as the program progressed, then they would start taking children uh, from conventional families. People, uh, you, there are so many kidnappings in this country. Especially, you notice it spiked in the 1970s and 80s, and these children were basically used for the mind control experiments. They knew, especially people with genetics of blonde hair, blue eyes, red hair, green eyes. Such people have an enzyme in their genetics that allow for mind control to be more acceptable to the mind and the body. What did they do with these children afterwards? Well, their bodies were, those who didn't make it, their bodies were disposed of. They would uh, burn them, bury them under the ocean. They would dispose of them in whatever manner was convenient at the time. 
What about those who did make it? Well, a lot of them, unfortunately, are in such a mental state that they're not able to function very well in society. A lot of the people that we see in mental institutions, a lot of the people that we see in, in, in prisons, uh, many of them have been subjected to these mind control experimentations. One of the people that I did meet over the years, also connected to government, told me that he knows in a very remote area outside of Reno, Nevada, the government has a facility where they actually store some of the subjects of mind control who are being used for continuous study under the guise of it being a home for the elderly or insane. So and, rather than kill them off, they have put them in this facility. Well, yes, they need to, to study. watch them. Yeah. yeah, they need to study the effects. You know, how long will a person live? What will their mind be like? Will they regain their memory? They, it's like being a lab rat, basically, to see. They want to see what the results will be so they know what the population uh, generally can expect. Is this a black ops program, Stuart? I mean, Congress doesn't know about it. Well, yes, of course it's under undercover, but there are many people in government now that know about it. Years ago, back in the 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s, I'm pretty sure that many of the people in the mainstream government didn't know about it. But these days, the secret government is becoming the public government. Well, that's true. And so there's many now who know about this. And, of course, uh, I was told uh, that uh, the government will never admit uh, a mind control experimentation because then they would be subjected to lawsuits and have to pay for uh, medical coverages, etc. So they're never, ever going to admit that. Now, this control, this mind control series of experiments, Stuart, what did they want to accomplish? Bottom line is they wanted to create a global robotic society, very much like you'd see on Star Trek, the Borg, where everyone has a specific function, a specific designation. No one asks any questions. You just go through your life doing what you're told to do in a specific function, and you never deviate from that. And in that way, it ensures a society that does not change, and the control system stays intact. My gosh. And you know what? They're, they're pretty much there. When I look out there in the public and I hear how people react to things, they just believe whatever they're told. No one questions anything. I, yes, there's a few people who, who like myself, who, who make a lot of noise. But for the most part, people just follow along and don't question anything. It's they're, like the Pied Piper of Hamlet. Yeah, they're afraid. They're afraid because they're, what will the government say? What will they do to me? So they just go along with everything. You see this in the airports. You see this in, in, in office buildings. Everyone is terrified of going outside the box. Stuart, I want you to stay with us. Uh, your website, of course, is expansions.com. When we come back, let's talk about your presence of knowledge with the aliens and the reptilians. This is an incredible story. Just around the corner here, uh, it's Stuart Swordlow. He is our guest tonight. If you need to email me, that's george at coast to coast am dot com. And those of you who are fast blasting me now, watching the TV show on the West Coast, and also listening to the radio program, I hope you have a good time and enjoy yourself. Get yourself a little uh, little pile there of popcorn and uh, just sit back and relax and enjoy. We'll be back in just a moment on Coast to Coast AM. So simply do not. Touch your dial. So do you think there's an alien presence here on planet Earth? Stuart thinks so. We'll talk with him about that next on Coast to Coast AM. The alien presence on this planet, Stuart, uh, if it exists, probably started a long time ago. We're going to spend some time this hour talking with you about it. What do you think? Well, that's a very large topic. And in order to explain it, I need to give a little bit of a history lesson. Okay. And if we go back to eons of time ago, we find out that the solar system as it exists today is not the way it used to be. In fact, uh, Earth used to be the second planet in orbit from the sun, and it was basically covered in water. Even the atmosphere was very liquidy. Mars was the third planet, and then there was a larger planet, which is called Maldek, uh, which existed between what is now Mars and Jupiter. And then after Jupiter was Saturn, then Uranus, Neptune, and that was it. Pluto did not exist. 
And then I need to go to another part of the galaxy to a place called the Lyrian Star System. Okay. How so, far? How many light years? Oh, gosh, I have no idea, but it's towards the center of the galaxy. Okay. Um, the Lyrian star system, for all intents and purposes, is where humanity ex began. That is the home area of all of humanity. There was also a star system called the Draco star system, and that was basically a reptilian empire. And the reptilians have a mindset where they feel an obligation to seek out and destroy or assimilate all other uh, creatures or species because they feel the reptilian life form is the most perfect representation of God or God mind. And the reason that they feel that way is because reptilians in the Draco star system are androgynous, meaning male and female in the same body. And so they feel that most closely represents the neutral uh, God mind or God energy. Also, Reptilian DNA does not change over eons of time. It basically stays the same and does not uh, alter, whereas mammalian DNA constantly changes and adapts uh, as environments change. And so they feel that because reptilians are so stable in genetics, it proves that they're superior. And again, I'm not qualifying this by saying this is right or wrong. I'm just saying that that's how they think. And so they attack the Lyrian star system, and basically dispersed any of the survivors that were in there. And the survivors of the Lyrian star system fanned out across the known galaxy and colonized other solar systems, this one included. When they came here, the planet Mars and the planet Maldek had atmosphere, oceans. It was a very inhabitable environment, and they started colonies there. The reptilian Dracos followed them across uh, the various colonies and attacked them. The Draco use uh, hollowed-out asteroids or comets as weapons and vehicles that they then send into space. And what they did was send an ice comet into our solar system to attack and destroy the colonies. As that ice comet came into the system, it caused the planet Uranus to flip on its axis. Uranus is the only planet known that orbits in a north-to-south uh, direction instead of an east-to-west as all other planets do, and that's because it was knocked off of its original um, axis. It then continued towards uh, the so in the solar system and approached the planet Maldek, and the pressure or the gravitational pull of the ice comet planet Maldek and the large gas planet Jupiter caused the Maldek to explode, which is why we have the asteroid belt now between Mars and Jupiter. Okay. And a lot of the fragments of Maldek became the many moons of Jupiter and Saturn as they get caught up in the, uh, in the um, gravitational fields. And in fact, the rings of Saturn recently have been exposed as being uh, pieces of ice and rock, which could have come from Maldek and the ice comet. So it must have been a pretty good-sized planet, Stuart. It was a, it was a very fair-sized uh, comet. Uh, and Maldek was a very large planet. I would say yeah. it was somewhere between the size of Mars and Jupiter. And then, as the comet approached Mars, it pulled a lot of the atmosphere off of Mars and a lot of the oceans off of Mars. And then finally went into an orbit with the planet Earth, and it went into this uh, rotation with the Earth so that the oceans on Earth started to polarize, and the spinning of the Earth started to form the ice caps, and eventually the Earth and this ice comet switched places so that the ice comet became the second uh, object in the orbit of the sun, and the Earth was pushed out to third position. The ice comet became the planet Venus as we know it now. All right, and this was very similar to what Velikovsky believes, right? Well, that's true. His theory was very, very, very correct for the most part. Now, because uh, the planet Venus or the ice comet was so close to the sun, it caused the ice to melt, uh, but rapidly to the point where it became steam and vapor, which is why Mars, uh, why Venus, Venus. is covering clouds. Okay.
And now the earth being pushed out into the second, uh, third position now became very inhabitable. Land masses appeared, um, and uh, the Draco drove another vehicle into orbit of this planet to colonize it, and we now call that object the moon. The moon, as you know, does not spin in space as other natural objects. Are you, are you, are you saying the moon is artificial, or it's natural, but it was pushed there? It was a, a, a hollowed-out uh, object, a natural object that was uh, dro- driven into orbit into the around the Earth. All right. So it was, it was a vehicle that was of a natural origin. Okay, okay. Yeah, and then uh, that's why only one side of the moon faces the Earth at all times. It doesn't spin. It's like a vehicle parked in space, which is basically what it is. And if you send a sonic resonance off the surface of the moon, it pings like a hollow object. It does not thump like a solid object. I've heard that. That's true. Yes. And and even now, and now we're starting to get a little bit of information. They're saying, well, there's a little bit of an atmosphere on the moon. There's a little bit of water on the moon. And Mars used to have oceans, and they're starting to just reveal some information that I've been talking about for years, which is basically verifying everything that I've been telling people all these decades. That's a remarkable story, and, you know, there have been glimpses of this. Are you familiar at all, Stuart, with the work of Zacharias Sitchin? Uh, Yes, of course. Now, where does his work come in in terms of that planet that comes here, Nibiru? Um, you, uh, You didn't mention that. Yes, you see, here's the other thing. That Nibiru, which is also in some uh, cultures called Marduk, um, this is also an artificial object uh, which has an elliptical orbit in space. It is controlled by another type of reptilian being. It is not the Draco, but it's actually a different species. Uh, the Anunnaki, which, he said, right? Yes, yes, and they tend, they, uh, what we learned at Montauk was that that group was actually enemies of the Draco and that they were antagonistic towards each other. Now, interestingly enough, um, back in uh, 1999, I believe it was in LA Times and possibly also in the New York Times, there was an article stating that a, a large object uh, NASA had detected past the orbit of Pluto in an elliptical mm-hmm. orbit around our sun, and that we can expect to see that object come closer to the Earth around the year 2003. That was back in 1999. And as usual, when the New World Order government sends out information that they want people to know, they send it out in a little blip like that, and then you never see it again. And that's kind of their legal out that they told you everything and that it wasn't a surprise. Now, where did this knowledge, where did this information come to you? How? Well, when we worked in Montauk, those 13 years that I was there, there was a lot of indoctrination. We were basically told that what we were doing was for the good of the earth, that humanity was not intelligent enough to control itself, that if people were left to their own device, they would pretty much destroy the planet. And so it was an obligation of this new world order to control things, to ensure that uh, our people continued and survived. That's what we were told. And to back it up, they gave us these pieces of history and information that uh, were to encourage us also to continue the work. But remember that what we were trying to do or what they made us do and what they turned me into is that they were trying to create a person who could see into other realities without mm-hmm. the use of a device. And in that mode, they recalibrated the way the brain perceived realities I was physically blind for 29 years. I could not see physical reality the way a normal person could see. I could only see energy fields, colors, and symbols, etc., which is how I do my, my readings and consultations. And so when we would do our work and be projected into other dimensions and realities, we would see this information, especially when we did time travel work, where we could then go back or forward and see exactly what the situation was at any specific time. And time travel really isn't as unusual as people think it is if you know about science. 
every point in time and space has a unique vibration or energy. Okay, now let's. I'm going to come back to time travel with okay. you next hour, but let's. Now, then, are you saying the first colonists on this planet were the reptilians? Yes, I'm sorry for diverting from that, but absolutely, right. the the first beings, the first colonies here were reptilians. Therefore. They consider this to be their planet and that we, uh, humans or mammalians, are the alien invaders. And so they colonized a very large land mass on the planet that appeared out of the oceans. And that has been called uh, in various cultures either Lemuria or Mu. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah, and that existed in what is now the Pacific Ocean. And uh, that culture lasted for many, many millennia. And they developed large cities of high technology and basically were preparing the planet for an assimilation into the Draco Empire. What year might that have been uh, in terms of uh, our knowledge of time? Uh, that would have been a close to about 800,000 B.C. 800,000. High technology. Very high technology. They brought that with them. And now... I need to go back into planetary science to explain why humans came here. Okay, and then how? Well, yes. When a when molten material is ejected from a star to form a planet, that molten material is thrown out into deep space and starts then to spin. And as it spins, it starts to cool off on the surface, and the surface starts to harden. But just as what happens on the surface, on the outside happens on the inside. The centrifugal force of the spin causes the molten material inside to start pushing against the sides of this now a sphere that it's forming. And so a hollow area forms inside such a planet, and the extra material is forced out through openings at the poles. And then the inside starts to harden, as does the outside because of the coldness of space. So what you then have is a planet with a hardened outside, a hardened inside, and molten material trapped in between the inner and outer mantles. In the very center of the hollow area is leftover molten material, what sometimes is referred to as an inner sun. But it's not really a sun, it's molten material. And then the openings at the poles still exist because that's where some of the molten material was ejected. And that is basic planetary science, and a lot of the planets in this solar system, including Earth and Mars, were formed that way. And so when Mars was affected by that ice comet, the colonists went to the inside of the planet uh, in order to be have safety. And so uh, some of those colonists wanted to come to this planet as a, as a refuge, and a lot of the other colonies that were uh, created from the refugees of Lyrae also needed a place to come. So it wasn't until very many millennia later that mammalians or human beings came to the Earth and colonized an area that was in now the Atlantic Ocean, and that was oh. called, uh, in cult, certain cultures, Atlantis. Atlantis. Okay, so I'm beginning to see, Stuart, just with this picture, uh, if the reptilians were in the Pacific on uh, Lemuria, mm-hmm. and uh, the human likes were on Atlantis, and now they're both gone, uh, I'm beginning to see the picture of some kind of major confrontation. Am, well, that's am exactly I right? correct. Yeah. Yeah, human uh, mammalians and reptilians are not designed to live in the same environment on the same planet. They have different requirements. So we basically have a situation where there's two different species that are very antagonistic towards each other, sharing the same location. So as you can imagine, there were hostilities between Lemuria and Atlantis that went on for a very long period of time. And in fact, the Hindu Vedas talk about this. Some of these Vedas are 200,000 years old and talk about uh, what we would describe as nuclear weapons and lances with mushroom clouds that form on the earth and talk about vehicles called vimanas that are what we would call spaceships or UFOs that would fly into the atmosphere. Good point. So they annihilated each other. Well, what really happened was Ultimately, the Atlanteans first killed off the dinosaurs. Now, the dinosaurs are to the, are to, are to the Draco what uh, mammalian creatures are to human, humanity. So 
there was a very big battles, and of course the dinosaurs were not killed off by a meteor that struck the Earth uh, 60 million years ago, because if, if that did happen, we wouldn't be talking right now. There wouldn't be anything left of this planet. Uh, that's a cover story. Uh, it was the Atlanteans who basically killed off the dinosaurs. Okay, well, why did they want to kill off the dinosaurs, even as, though as they a, looked similar to the reptilians? Well, you know, look what's happening to us now. If you want to destroy humanity, kill the food source, kill the, 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 the support structure for that culture. Did they eat dinosaurs, the reptilians? Yes, they did. Oh, that they was did. their source of food work. Okay, okay. You know, that, that, to them, that, like we have cows and horses and other mammalian creatures, they had those creatures. And so basically what happened was the Atlanteans used geomagnetic technology to, to destroy Lemuria and cause it to sink into what became the Pacific Ocean. And the only remnants of that now are the Hawaiian Islands, Japan, Philippines, Taiwan, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, the South Pacific Islands, and the uh, California west of the San Andreas fault line is also. And what happened to all the reptilians who were on that landmass at the they, time? And now, here's the interesting. The ones who survived went inside the earth, the hollow earth. And that began the legends of demons under the earth or hell under the earth. That's ah. where that began. So when you think of the devil, you do think of a reptilian type. Mm -hmm. horned with a tail. Mm -hmm. uh, Living under the earth. That could be what the reptilians look like. That's they exactly. look like the devil, or the devil looks like them. Exactly, exactly. And they look, that's right, and they're in the, you know, the, the hotter part of the planet, in the inner core, down below. It makes sense. That's where Hades is. Yes, and that's where that, those legends began. And uh, the Atlanteans, contrary to a lot of new agey information, actually were not the very nice people either. They also had an agenda of um, genetic manipulation. They, they used to blend different species together to see the kind of results. Uh, basically, uh, they tried to create workforces uh, made out of animals and humans, animals and insects, etc., etc. The legends of merfolk, for example, are when they took uh, dolphins and mixed them with humans. Uh, Sasquatch or Bigfoot was the result of bear mixed with uh, humans. How about mermaids? Same thing. That was dolphins mixed with uh, human genetics. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So know? that's where and, the, uh, and that's curious. Interesting because, you know, uh, people with autism really are descendants of that hybridization process because they have dolphin genetics and autism is really being a dolphin in a human body for all intents and purposes. So that's, that's another topic. This is wild stuff, Stuart. Well, it sounds wild if you haven't heard about it, but if you look at it and study it and you see the science behind it, it does make a lot of sense. What happened to the Atlanteans? Well, they basically, over a series of uh, three cataclysms, destroyed their own continent, uh, which sank beneath the ocean, became the Atlantic Ocean. The only remnants left of that are the Azores, uh, Canary Islands, the Caribbean Islands, Bermuda, and interestingly, Montauk Point is the end of an archipelago uh, that used to exist of Montauk. Of, right, stay of with us, Stuart. More to come when we come back on Coast to Coast AM. It's a fascinating, fascinating analogy, Stuart, where the reptilians went underground, which then was perceived to be hell, and they the devil, and evil, and it's it just incredible. It, it does make sense. Yes, and, you know, it continued after that because when the Atlanteans finally destroyed themselves and they also scattered around the earth and created the Egyptian civilization, the Greek, and even it went into North and South America, um, then well, a few thousand years after that, the reptilians decided to retake the surface of the earth, but because of their appearance and so much time had passed, humans were not used to them any longer and considered them to be frightening. So what they did was create a hybridization program. And the hybridization program basically uh, was for the, uh, the reptilians to take back the surface by breeding and intermarrying with the uh, human population. But I need to go back just uh, one more time to when the Lemurians and the Atlanteans were at war, just, just to explain something. There was a period of time when a peace negotiation was in process, 
And during that time, they decided to create a new type of being on the planet that would be a mixture of reptilian and human. Uh, and this was prior to the devastation. Right. This was prior. This was an attempt at peace between the two. Okay. And that, the, pro, the thing is, the, the deal was the reptilians wanted to take the uh, foundation as the androgynous reptilian body and then add mammalian or human genetics to it. And now this is interesting because in the Bible it says, and people never question this, it says in Genesis, let us make man in our image. And so why is it plural? Who is the we and who is the mm -hmm. our? And in ancient Hebrew, all references to God are plural. There are no singular references to God as an individual. It is always plural. And if you look at the way human beings gestate in utero, you see that in the first few weeks of life, they are basically androgynous reptilians. And then mammalian features are added to it during the, uh, the gestational period. And that's because the genetics are following the sequence in which they were added. So all we have to do is look at how human fetuses develop to see how we start as androgynous reptilians and then finally become mammalian. Could this genetic manipulation, uh, uh, could that have been where the story of Adam and Eve occurred? Absolutely, and the allegorical story of how Eve was created from the rib of Adam is basically about how an androgynous reptilian body was created, was broken down into male and female components. That's an allegorical story of Adam and Eve. Should have asked one of our guests last night who believes he's the reincarnated Adam. <laughs> I see. Well, we all are in some way, aren't we? Yeah, well, I guess we are. Okay, so... Some of the stories in the, that, we, that we hear about in Genesis, the fallen angels, the taking of women, earth, you know, yes. that, that could have been the reptilians coming down to interbreed, right? Correct. And even the Hebrew word Elohim means those who descend from above. Mm -hmm. It's a reference to basically, that's what we would call people that come down in spaceships. Okay. How many reptilians fled underground after the devastation? What do you think? Uh, my estimate or the estimate that, that we've been told over the years at Montauk was approximately 3 million. But I can't verify that number, obviously. That's just what we were told. Okay. And that they did, uh, see, because they're androgynous, they replicate on uh, a parthenogenic basis. They don't need any uh, spouse. They just create uh, during a cycle and, and give birth. Are uh, they underground now? Yes, they are still there. And, uh, you know, if you look at current events and you look at China and other areas where all of these mining accidents are occurring and people are dying underground, um, I know that a lot of those mining accidents are cover stories about what's going on underneath the ground where the reptilians are battling human beings. And this occurs even here in North America where we have over 130 underground bases in this continent, and there's a lot of battling going on under the ground, especially are, in the Mojave. Are there flying crafts still around that belong to the reptilians? Yes, there are, and I do have to say that a large percentage of the so-called UFOs that we see that are reported in this uh, planet, uh, many of them come from here. There are not so many from elsewhere, but many come from this own, from our planet. Who and has we, the higher technology, the reptilians or earthlings? I both. Guess. We have uh, government craft, and we also have the reptilian craft. And we have, of course, the mixture of others that come here, but for the most part, um, there's only four or five alien civilizations now that interact with this planet that are allowed to come here. Uh, there used to be a lot more years ago, and that's been stopped because of uh, the government taking over a lot of the control systems of uh, interactions with aliens. Are we interacting now with the reptilians, or are we at war with them? That is a very good question, because... The, the Illuminati, who are basically the descendants of the hybridization program, have their own agenda, and their agenda is a bit different than the original reptilian agenda. Okay, so we're getting into a little David Icke a little bit, right? Yes, uh, his information is very good. You know, he's a, he's a friend of mine, and, I, and we've talked about shape-shifting and, and how it occurs. Um, and I, if you'd like, I'll give you a brief description of, of shape-shifting. When 
a person has a split of 50-50 genetics. In other words, 50% reptilian, 50% human. God, what would you look like at a 50-50 split? Well, that's the thing, is what would the genetics defer to? It goes by the mind pattern or the soul personality operating the body. So, for example, if you have a reptilian soul personality in such a body, the body would defer to reptilian genetics and manifest as a reptilian. If you needed to hide behind a human form and you needed to be in public as a human, but you had this reptilian body, the only way to maintain the human form is by ingesting human hormones, blood, organs, etc. that would then jump or boost the, the human genetics to manifest in that form instead. And that is why uh, many of these Illuminati societies have these sacrificial rituals or sexual rituals where they bring up the human harmonics or energies so that they can maintain the human form. Some people I've looked at have what I've always thought to be reptilian-looking eyes. Yes. Can they, these shapeshifters, can they hide the eyes Yes, they can, but you know, when they get very angry or they get very uh, intense, the eyes shift, and you can see they, this they a get, lot. They, they get yellow or they get black. And they look like slits, you know, yeah. instead of the round pupils. And you can see that this happens sometimes on TV. You could, If you look at sometimes some of the government officials when they're speaking, on occasion you can see that happen <laughs> briefly. And, and you have to ask yourself, and you look at all these skin conditions that these uh, leaders have where suddenly they're going to the hospital, getting skin lesions removed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's when you shapeshift frequently, the body then starts to lose the genetic memory of what shape am I. So very often when they go back to human form, there's a spot or two here or there that maintains reptilian form, and then they have to cover that up. Give me a painted picture here, Stuart, of a, what a reptilian looks like. There are... I'm, try, I'm picturing a crocodile. Maybe that's not right. Huh? Well, that's not exactly right, uh, but... We know that there are seven different species within the Draco Empire or hierarchy. And interestingly, when the Soviet Union sent a, uh, a vehicle to, to Venus in the 1980s to actually go below the cloud layer and shoot pictures before the heat destroyed the camera, right. it sent back a, a picture of the surface with seven domed areas in a row. We never saw those pictures. We didn't see the pictures, but in the in American newspapers, there was an article on it in the late 1980s that said that there were these seven domed areas, and it went on and on to describe them as being unusual. And then the very end, yeah. as a par for the course, it said that NASA determined that these seven domed areas were natural formations. Of course, they're right. not going to say what they really are. And so that would, if you know about reptilian culture and you know about the seven species and there's a hierarchy, they don't mix together, it would make very good sense that when you colonize an area, you have separate living quarters for each of the species. And so um, the different species look like the very high or elite group are very tall, uh, white-skinned reptilians with blue eyes, and they sometimes have been known to have wings on the back. Reptilian type skin? Yes, it's not exactly as scaly as you'd see on a crocodile or an alligator, but it's very rough uh, skin that looks as if it's segmented in places. What about their faces? The faces can look very human-like or humanoid. They have two eyes and nose and mouth, but the reptilian have that... Uh, what I call cat eyes. They look like cat eyes, and they have a very uh, pronounced jaw and very uh, pronounced teeth. Um, and they have very powerful bodies, especially the elite group, the, uh, the top of the hierarchy. And when you go down the, 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 the uh, hierarchy to the bottom, there's a shorter version. There's a, there's a kind of reptilian that's only four, four and a half feet tall, it's kind of brown skin, very slight. They're very much like workers or drones that would do uh, the, the grunt work or, the, or the, what we would call the untouchables in Hindu society. All right. Well, this picture that uh, you, we've all seen of the devil who could have been a reptilian, where did that come from, the longer tail and the horns? That 
comes from the ancient perception of what a reptilian being looks like. And very often they do have horns. Not all of them do, but some of them do. Maybe a senior group or something like that? The uh, Again, the, the uh, middle version, there's a warrior caste that tends to have the horns, and they're very bulky, very aggressive. Uh, you wouldn't want to meet one of them. Would they be the ones, though, to lead the pack? Or the other ones? They would be what you call an advanced guard. They'd be the ones you'd send out uh, when you're invading a planet or an area. Um, and they're very volatile. And, uh, you know, there's a difference um, in sometimes how they use human appearance because the shapeshifters can physically change to human form. However, there are reptilians that are not, of course, able to do that because they're purebred. They don't have human genetics. What they sometimes have is a device around their waist that creates a holographic image around them that makes them appear human. But they're not shape-shifting. It's just a holographic image that's projected around them. Well, that could be, uh, I guess, altered or... Uh, it could be breached, right? If somebody tried to touch them or something, would we, you know, it'd be like going through a hologram. Yes, and I did witness that in um, Montauk Project because there were reptilians occasionally there, but these were not shapeshifters. These were real, hundred percent reptilians, and in order to not terrify a lot of the people, they would sometimes use this holographic image around them. Do you be- do, do you believe that the the Illuminati the power brokers on this planet, the very wealthy families, that they could be from this reptilian strain? They are. In fact, mm-hmm. the Illuminati are, are made up of 13 ruling families, and all of them can trace their ancestry to the hybridization program that really went back to the Sumerian times. So they're human beings, but they have reptilian a very DNA. high percentage of reptilian genetics, yes. Amazing. Are, are they shapeshifters, or the, the, or they actually look this way? Some are. Not all of them are shapeshifters. It depends on the exact 50-50 split of genetics. So there are some who do not shapeshift, but still are uh, in the elite group. And the reason they call themselves blue bloods is because reptilian blood has a very high copper content. And when copper oxidizes, it looks like a blue-green color. Mm -hmm. And that is why they've been called blue bloods over the centuries. You know, just last week I had a story of a guy who had uh, uh, green blood in his system. Oh, yeah, that was in Vancouver. Yeah, I mean, could he be? Well, you see, here's what's happening now. They're very methodically releasing information about this to the public. And this is one of the stories. Now, the cover story to that was the man had some kind of disease where his blood would not accept oxygen. Right, right. Exactly. Well, he- well, hello, if that was the case, he'd be dead. He wouldn't be operating on him because he would have no oxygen. The cells would have died. So, of course, that was just a cover story. You know, if he had bl- green blood, and, of course, in the article that they mentioned, the Canadian Free Press, they compared him to Spock on Star Trek. So there's, again, the alien connection that the conventional media is giving out to the public. We're in a period of time now where they are disseminating information about the alien presence on the Earth, but they're doing it in such a way that people can accept they're not going to tell the absolute truth about who the reptilians are and what's going on. They're going... To go, create, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. They're going to create a staged alien invasion. And when that happens, they're going to have a savior race come and help us, who will turn out to be the reptilians. And then, of course, the reptilians will announce that they were the colonists on the earth and they're part of us and we're part of them. And uh, it becomes uh, an integrated process then. How then bizarre. Mm-hmm. My gosh, Stuart, that's going to change the entire complexity of this planet. Well, that's correct. And that's kind of what I was leading to before about the uh, the uh, Illuminati agenda or the hybrid agenda, is that they're trying to create their own galactic empire using the Earth as a home base, which is a bit contrary to what the reptilian race wanted originally. Are, are these the ones that want the population reduced to 500 million? Well, see, I don't agree with that. 
story because what I know is that they're in the process of creating Earth-like uh, environments in the moons of Jupiter and Saturn to move the population. They're not going to. They didn't spend millennia of time creating this vast slave race to destroy it. They're going to use it in wherever they see fit. Are you saying they're going to cattle cow humans, take them on craft, much like that? To serve man Twilight Zone show where they ate them, they cooked them. Right. I but basically, that. to put them on craft and take them to other planets and and uh, celestial objects. Well, that's that's bottom lining it, but yes, that's ultimately what will be happening. When will this occur? Well, I feel that will occur sometime after 2010. Um, and we're already getting prepared for it. They're already talking about finding Earth-like planets out in other solar systems. They're already talking about various objects in space that are unknown and strange. They're preparing the population for the uh, assimilation into a galactic uh, mindset. What an incredible possibility, Stuart. Well, how, I mean, do we, how do we fight it? Well, that's just it, and that's why I do the work that I do. I consider it an obligation because of the things I participated in in the Montauk Project. I'm not a reptilian, am I? We all have reptilian DNA. All humans on this planet have reptilian DNA. It's a question of percentages. Most humans have between 10 and 15 percent uh, reptilian DNA. That's why we have a lymphatic uh, reptilian uh, system. We have skin that wrinkles and peels. We have a lot of reptilian characteristics in our bodies, and that comes from that hybridization that occurred eons ago. So, yes, we're all part reptilian. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can see that in the gestation of, of a person. In the if, if they were confused as gods, that does not negate a god, right? Correct. There is a god. There is a god mind. It permeates all things. Nothing can exist without it. And when we look at DNA, we see that 97% of all DNA, and it doesn't matter if you're a human, an elephant, an alien, or a plant, science calls it junk DNA. Stuart, when we come back, let's talk a little bit more about, you say, the staged alien invasion and then time travel, how quickly this night goes. And the next hour, we'll open up the phone lines and we'll give you an opportunity to talk with Stuart Swordlow. I'm George Norrie. This is Coast to Coast AM. Incredible guest tonight, Stuart Swordlow. Great stories. The staged alien invasion is next on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast with Stuart Swordlow. Stuart, let's talk about this staged alien invasion. This fascinates me. So uh, tell me how it could occur and what the motive is behind it. You know, for the last uh, century, in order to uh, create uh, control over people, the best way is to instill fear. And so we've seen this with World War II, the fear of the Nazis, then the Cold War. And now we have the terrorist fear. Everyone's afraid and trying to unite against that. Some of the fear could be real, but maybe magnified. Yes, but of course the terrorists are a creation of the New World Order and would not exist on their own. Very possible. Yeah. Uh, there's no way that they could have possible... Uh, well, it's a little long story, but... So the next thing is to create a fear beyond this planet that would cr force the planet to unite under one world government. In other words, create the situation so the solution can be imposed. If we are told that we are being attacked by an unknown alien civilization with amazing weapons, imagine the fear and terror that would pervade the Earth. Everybody would band together. Correct, and demand that the countries of the Earth do something together to stop this threat. Yes. And, of course, then we would have a new world order government, a singular government that controls the planet, which we already have anyway, but now would be officially wanted by the people. That would be a public. And then we would have this imaginary battle. They have something called Blue Beam Project, and Blue Beam Project is holographic images that are projected into the atmosphere and can look like anything. It can look like a, a religious figure. It can look like a UFO fleet. It could look like missiles. They've been targeting and practicing with this since the early 1960s when they actually tested it mm -hmm. over Havana Harbor when a U.S. submarine uh, projected the image of the Virgin Mary over Havana 
and was seen by all the people in the evening streets. And you can shut it off anytime you want. It Correct. just disappears, right? Absolutely. They've been testing it recently in various places of the earth. All these meteor falls, for example, uh, Sydney Airport a few months ago reported a meteor on their radar, and then people saw this this meteor come and actually hit the ground and explode. And when the uh, emergency services went to the area, there was absolutely nothing there because it was a holographic image that they were testing. And we've seen this in various places around the world. That's Bluebeam Project. And so when they project alien fleets in the sky and they project uh, you know, laser beams or whatever they're going to use to scare people with, that is what people are going to see and fear. But it gets a little thicker than that because... All right. It's the, a strange stuff, Stuart. Well, the, this has been planned for years, decades, and we're finally coming to the culmination of this. They're also going to stage a second coming of Christ, and that second coming is going to proclaim the new world order as his new holy empire, and they're going to install a new world religion as well, which is already in process also. So this planet is going to be very different than what we've known it to be in the past. As crazy as this sounds, some of it, I'm not so sure I can accept the second coming, but as crazy as this sounds, some of it sounds very possible. Well, all you got to do is look at the newspaper, watch CNN, and you can see all of it happening. And it's right there in front of us. What minds developed this? Well, these are. this is not new. This has been going on since day zero on this planet for the ultimate domination and control of the planet. But I feel that it cannot ultimately be successful because, as I mentioned before the last break, we have that 97% of DNA that scientists call junk DNA. And the thing is that that 97% is common through all species, no matter what the species. To me, that's proof of God or God mind, that there's a common 97% DNA through all species. And only 3% of DNA differentiates species and individuals within that species. So to me, that's very mind-boggling and proof of a higher intelligence. If we can tap in and open up that unused DNA, we would have abilities that would enable us to remove victimization mind pattern that enables these things to occur. Well, explain that a little bit more. How? Well, human beings have a victimization mind pattern that attracts tyrants and depressors. And we project out from our minds into physical reality what our thoughts are, and the universe reflects that for us. Think of the analogy as thoughts being film, the brain being the projector, and physical reality as the screen. So if we don't like the movie of our life that's playing, we need to change the film, which is the way we think. If we think in victimization terms and vulnerability terms, mm -hmm. we will create that kind of a world. If we take our mind back and control ourselves, then this cannot happen. We cannot be controlled by others. Why do they need the alien invasion to implement this? Why don't they just continue to push the terrorism agenda, for example? I mean, that will create fear no matter what, especially if they uh, magnify it. Initially, but that can last for just so long, just like the Cold War could only last for just so long. Then well, the, right? and then people will say enough is enough. Right, but an alien threat, well, that's out there in the universe, which is vast, that's forever. And it's also them against us. Correct. Basically. Correct. And so that's the ultimate fear user where everybody wants to band together to fight against this. Stuart, you do know if this is possible, how warped their minds must be. Well, you know, again, that's why I explained the reptilian mindset. Uh, they think differently than human beings. We think in a different way than they do. They have in their minds all the time in the world because their genetics don't change. Their culture stays the same through mind control and programming, so there's no deviation. They're very sure of what they're doing. To them, in their minds, what they do is holy to them. How long do they live each 
as a physical being, how long? Well, we know the Queen Mother admitted to being 100-something years old, and she was a lot older than that. They can live several hundred years in the same body. The Queen Mother is a reptilian? Oh, she was, yes. <laughs> did, did you see the size of her coffin? It was not no. the size of her human body. I did not see the size of her coffin. Is there a picture I can find on the Internet? Well, there might be. I don't know. But it was quite much larger than what should have been for that little lady's body. <laughs> How big was it? It was, it was pretty large. It was, uh, to me, like, like a little like, piano like... case. <laughs> oh, like eight feet, nine feet? It was big. I don't know how. I mean, you can only see from the pictures, but it was you, very large. You're, you're saying when she died, the Queen Mother reverted to the reptilian stage. Yes. Yeah. And then became this large reptilian, and that's what they buried her, her in. Yes, yes, that is correct. Sounds like David Icke's been getting to you on this one, Stuart. Well, you know, the truth is still the truth. I've had... Reporters tell me that they know about this, but cannot ever report on it. You mean uh, British reporters? Or, uh, one, or report actually, an American reporter said this to me, as well as a British reporter. That the royal family, they're, are they pure reptilians or no, hybrids? They're shapeshifters, obviously. They, they go into human form. And isn't it interesting that Prince Harry this week said that he could never be normal? Now, of course, you could take that several ways. But I take it in a way that uh, he knows he's also a reptilian shapeshifter. Well, I was going to say, do these members know who they are or yes. what they are? Of course. When you're a shapeshifter, you know that. You know what you are. And All right, but how, how come y y you said like yourself that you have reptilian blood, I do. Mm -hmm. That's what you said. How come you can't shapeshift? Because I don't have a 50-50 split in genetics. Ah, but they do. They do. I see. Okay. Yeah. You can so the, Yeah, you need to have a majority at least uh, of of the genetics in order to manifest the characteristics of the species. Most people in power on this planet are 50/50? No, I would not say most. I would say that there is a, quite a few, but most I would say most are not shapeshifters, but there are many shapeshifters, and they're not just in control positions. There are many in all walks of life because they need to control every layer of mankind. Are there some people who may be more human who go along with the alien agenda? Yes, of course, there are many factions within this, which is why we're seeing the world the way it is, because these 13 families, even though they have the same ultimate goal, do fight among themselves and do take sides against one another. And so we're seeing now a battle between the Windsors and the Rothschilds and the Romanoffs for complete control of the planet. Now, these 13 families, do they geographically spread all over the planet, or are they primarily in Europe? Where are they? They're mostly based in Europe, but they have sectioned out the world under different control for different families. For example, the Windsors are in control of the British Isles and North America and Australia whereas the Rothschilds controlled mainland Europe and Africa and parts of Asia. If we grabbed one of them and gave them an x-ray, what would we see? Would they look human? Well, on an x-ray, of course, if they're in a human form, they'd look human. So if everything they're... changes. Yes, yes. The whole structure, the whole genetic polygraph. Okay, almost like a werewolf. Well, that's, into... where, that's where it comes from. That's the type of uh, genetics. When you have that type of genetics where... There can, it can override the other genetics. You can manifest other characteristics. Simply amazing. And, you know, we see this sometimes in Simply humans amazing. when we have people born with webbed hands or feet or uh, people born with a tail. We have these characteristics sometimes manifest in, uh, in births in humanity, but they're called uh, anomalies or throwbacks to ancient time. That, but it goes, it's really a form of shape-shifting. I do have someone sending me now, as we speak, a picture of the Queen Mum's coffin. So okay. I'm going to I'm going to take a look at it, and uh, we'll see what it looks like. While while we're doing this, and I'm taking a picture of this, all right, here it is. Okay, it does look long. I'll tell you. I mean, it looks yeah, it looks about three feet longer than a normal coffin. Yes, yes. Uh, maybe she was wearing her. No, I guess not. That's on top. No, she wasn't wearing her Queen's. Uh, Hat. Nothing like that. That's strange. 
Okay, Tim, let's talk a little bit in the last few moments we have here about before the calls next hour, uh, Stuart. Time travel. What's your take on time travel? Yeah, as I mentioned very earlier, it is not as complicated as you would think. Uh, every point in time and space has a unique frequency and vibration. There are no two points in time and space that are identical. So if you can map out and vibrate an object, person, or thing to a specific point in time and space, there will be an instant connection because they, it, have, it would have to match. And that's how time travel and interdimensional travel takes place. You simply vibrate the body or a vehicle to a, a distant location, and there's an instant connection. The, the, and we don't need to do this without, with a machine, right? Well, of course, at Montec, it was uh, technological. But in my work, I do teach a form of mental time travel where you can mentally and energetically uh, tune into a specific time and place. Give us some other realities on this planet, uh, Stuart, that have fascinated you in your investigations. Well, you know, one of the things that I found most fascinating was the fact that there are infinite realities basically occupying the same physical location. But the calibration of the vibrations are different so that we don't perceive them. It's kind of like a radio. You can tune the dial just a little bit at a time and get a completely different station, yet it's coming from the same radio. And that's what reality is like. If you can tune into a different frequency, you can see an entirely different vibration so that there are realities where Earth is very different. There are realities where the reptilians never got here. There are realities where the Atlantean civilization stayed intact. There are realities where the Nazis won the war and took over the world. Every possibility exists. So whatever you can possibly think of or conceive of exists somewhere in creation. You know, what fascinates me about everything you've said tonight, Stuart, was the fact that the people may have construed the uh, the reptilians who went underground as being devils and hell uh, in that entire episode. I mean, I find that to be absolutely fantastic and fascinating. Well, you know, everyone finds uh, different aspects of this information uh, for whatever reason that individual likes. Um, but, you know, for me, uh, what I'd like to get across is that despite all of this, there's still hope. And that is if we regain control of our own minds individually, then the control system would disappear. All right, and tell think, me. I'm sorry, go ahead. I think people need to realize that it's not hopeless. It's not a one-way street. We can reverse this if we take control of ourselves. Well, we have to do it in mass. We can't do it uh, in small numbers, can we? That's true, but we need to start individually, and that's why I do the work that I do uh, with the language of hyperspace and opening DNA and visualizations so that we can reintegrate the mind and then recreate our reality. You and Richard Hoagland need to get together when you talk about hyperspace. Uh -huh. Well, we should all get together and, and, and change the way things are. Do you Now tell me, what do you talk about at some of these conferences you go to? Well, I like to start out with what I call language of hyperspace, which is color, tone, and archetype, which I describe as the language of God mind. All thought, if you could see the energy of thought, would have a color, a symbol, and a, and a vibration or tone to it. If you learn how to connect them, and, and a, like a sentence, if you will, you can create whatever it is that you want on, in physical reality. And I, I teach how to open DNA. I use color therapy. And in fact, for your listeners, on my website, I have a free ebook that they can download uh, on color therapy. This is particularly the color brown uh, that they can use and try for themselves. Uh, the mind really is everything. The brain is simply a tool that the mind uses, and we only use 10% or less of our brain capacity. So if we start to open a fraction of that other 90%, you can just imagine the abilities and functions that we could do, and we can change everything on this planet. And Will you take yeah, emails through your website? Oh, yes, I get hundreds of emails per day. And, of course, my website is expansions.com. 
And um, those of you who go on there, you'll see my phone number, my fax, and you can even, uh, this Q&A, I answer everyone, answer all questions. I have daily news that I post. Um, it's very comprehensive. Okay. Well, I, I got to tell you, Stuart, um, keep up the good work. Let's take phone calls next hour with people of everything you've investigated, the Montauk Project, the Reptilian Agenda, it's the you know, the the mind control is there one facet there that just fascinates you more than the next well what i have been doing a lot of in the last few years is deprogramming work which is to undo the mind control that the government has imposed on people and i work with people all over the world uh to help them deprogram from this pervasive uh, system and i find that is the most important work to do right now well, that is fascinating. Uh, you can email me, George, at coasttocoastam.com. I'm getting lots of fast blasts about Stuart and some of the things that he is uh, talking about tonight. So we'll do this, too. We'll open up the phone lines. We'll give you the opportunity to check in with us next as well. I'm George Norrie. We'll be back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie. Stuart Swerdlow is our guest and your phone calls as well. Is everybody under this mind control attack, Stuart? Are we all the potential targets? At this point, 100% of the Earth is targeted, and everyone has some form of mind control within their, their brains. But there's about 5% of the population that has specific uh, programming, which means they have very deep functions. And we see this sometimes in uh, people who are shooters, vigilante programming, stalkers. There's a many, many different types of programs out there. Oh, some could be pure evil, though, Stuart. Some of these people could be committing these crimes of horror on their own, don't you think? Well, that is also true. But if you notice, in this last uh, 50 years, there's been a very high percentage of these kinds of crimes out there, especially ritualistic murders and serial killers. And this is a side effect or actually a, a direct uh, cause by the mind control and programming. To the phones we go, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with us on Coast to Coast. Hi there. Hi, this is uh, Josh from Columbus, Ohio. How are you doing hey, tonight? Good, Josh. Thanks for calling. Hey, no problem. Um, I had a uh, question for uh, Stuart. Um, I'm a uh, very uh, religious, uh, spiritual person, and I actually happen to uh, sort of agree with what you're saying. I actually believe that uh, uh, Yahweh or Yahweh, the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I actually think this might be the God of the humans, the Atlanteans. And, and, and what you're saying about uh, the reptilians, it just speaks to me because what do we hear about Satan? The first thing, what is he? He's the, he's the snake, the reptilian in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the beast at the end of times in the book of Revelation is the dragon. So I'm, I'm very curious to, uh, to see whether you believe that maybe there is some sort of uh, connection between, you know, uh, Judeo-Christian beliefs in the creator God, who would maybe our God, the human God, uh, versus uh, the reptilian god who may be Satan. Uh, and I'll uh, take uh, the answer off air. Thank you. Okay, Josh, go ahead. You can elaborate, Stuart. Thank you. Well, let me just start out by saying there's only one god. It's not god of humans and god of reptilians. There's only one god, or I call god mind, that creates all of existence. What we see in the Bible, as far as the gods of the ancient Hebrews, they were alien beings. They were uh, beings who directed humanity in a certain direction. Uh, they also genetically manipulated. They talk about taking the uh, the uh, daughters of the sons of man as wives, etc. These this is a hybridization program that we're seeing here, and the God mentioned in the Bible, uh, especially in the Old Testament, is none other than an, than alien beings. Even the story of leading the Hebrews out of Egypt across the desert, uh, follow, following the pillars of light. These are what we would call UFOs in present uh, terms. As far as the reptilians are concerned, they worship what, from a religious perspective, would be called demonic entities. But from my perspective, I call it entities from lower astral la layers of existence. These are non-physical beings who 
manipulate uh, society and people from the astral planes, and there is such a thing as uh, connecting to the minds, what is called possession, um, and, the, and the reptilians worship them. Uh, ultimately, if we go back far enough, there is only one God mind, there is only one creator, and even in the Bible, it says that Satan only has the power that God gives him or it. Um, so I don't know if I've actually answered the question, but this is my perspective on the, the God situation. Off to our first-time caller line. Hello there. You're with us. Go ahead. Hi. This is Peter from Long Beach. My question to you is if, you know, there is still a God and, and things like that, what happens when we die. What happens with the reptilians when they die? Do we still go to the same place or do we go to a different place? And I also want to talk about a little bit about like uh, resurrection, such as like, or a person who is faking their death and coming back, such as like Machiavelli. And there's the last thing I want to ask is what about homosexuality? How does that cease, How does that seem to exist into our being if we are basically hybrid? All right, well, let's take the first two, because that's a topic. The second, last topic is not what Coast to Coast is all about. I don't get into those kind of issues, Stuart. So uh, okay. if you'd address the, the first couple things that he so eloquently passed on, go ahead. Okay, well, when a person passes on, what they initially experience is based on what their mind pattern is projecting, so that if you think when you die you're going to see Jesus, that's what you're going to see your mind will project into the astral layers that you go into, um, whatever it is that you perceive. Ultimately, we all go into an area of what I call oversoul or hyperspace level, where your higher intelligence directs and reviews the life time that you've just experienced and then determines where it is that you need to go next, whether it's on the earth or somewhere else. Uh, reptilians, as far they also have soul personalities, except that they're more species mind related. In other words, instead of being so much as an individual, they're more like a group mind or a hive mind, which is what they're trying to create in humanity through programming. So ultimately, we all experience what we think we're going to experience initially, and then as we become more aware of what and who we really are. We go into other dimensions and existences to help us progress in our path uh, back towards the God mind. So it would be different initially for each individual, but ultimately we all go back to source or God mind. Okay, thanks. Let's go to our wild card line. You're on with Stuart Swidlow on Coast to Coast. Hi there. Hey, this is David here in San Diego. Yeah, Dave, go ahead. Hey, uh, I just want to let you, I got the Lemurian Fellowship booklet in front of me here. And I've actually been to their compound, and I've done some work for them. And the creepiest thing is that they're all old, all gray-haired old people, and they they're really small, and they they don't really, none of them would talk to me except for the main guy, and the rest of them just stood around with their hands clasped in front of them, smiling like beatifically at me, you know. And I tried to talk to them, and they refused to talk to me. They would just smile. And also on the back of their book, uh, the one thing they say that their order is for is to uh, the formation of an ideal society and uh, long-term efforts to, uh, to, for their plan, the great work, and to build for a uh, quality for citizenship in the new coming order, the coming new order, and that is really creepy. And the Atlantis is their second coming of the uh, is the second uh, civilization. The first one was the continent of Mu in the Pacific Ocean, and I just wanted to let you guys know that I didn't hear it say it. Okay, Stuart, uh, you want to comment on that, and then I have a question about Atlantis for you. Yeah, well, to me, what this gentleman in San Diego just mentioned uh, sounds like there might be some kind of a cult. 
um, although I do agree with Lemurian coming first and then the Atlantean civilization existing. Um, I, you know, I, I've never heard of this group particularly before, but it could very well be a group that's a form of mind control or programming. There's all kinds of programming out there, as we saw with the um, the group that committed suicide when uh, Hal Bop came by. So there's many different subgroups out there uh, and what I would call a, a cult. Would you get chipped stored if they asked you to, a microchip? Well, unfortunately, I already have some of these chips in me that have been uh, x-rayed, actually. What? Yeah. In fact, um, all people who were in Montauk Project and anyone who claims to be abducted for whatever reason, many of these people do have chips in them. I will say that the uh, microchips are kind of an obsolete technology now because – the way the satellite technology is and computer technology, they don't even have to chip you anymore. They can tune in directly to your brain frequency and direct you in whatever way they wish. Uh, they don't have to microchip. The microchip you can consider as a backup system, um, but they no longer need that. Okay, let's pick it up and we'll go uh, to our next wild card line. It's your turn. You're on with Stuart. Hi there. Hi, Stuart. How are you? Hi. It's great if it is me. George, you know, you really do have to get that to where they have the uh, different wild card lines so that when you uh, when you go to a caller, they know they're on the air. Yeah, it, it is true. Every time I go to a wild card line, you all think it's you, don't you? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, you start talking. It's great. Stuart, uh, we got we got to figure out how that is. Maybe... I tell you what, uh, I'll talk with Tom about it. I know how I know how we can fix it. Go ahead, thanks. You've got it. Hey, Stuart. Uh, first of all, uh, this is Chad in Seattle, Washington. Hello. Uh, with Inner Circle Publishing, and I tell you what, you did your homework. Um, you know more than you're allowed to say, and yet you're saying it anyway, and I appreciate that. Um, first of all, have you seen them yourself? The reptilians. Yeah. Yes, I've, I have seen them, and I've also have seen someone shape shift directly in front of me. Okay, so you've direct contact. Um, do you know about the domes, the deep underground military bases? We've got about 180 of them in the U.S. Yes, this is uh, known, and there's many more around the world and even under yeah. the ocean. Yeah, even connecting. Yeah, interesting. Um, do you know where 91% of the missing children in this country end up? Well, many of them went end up in ritual sacrifice, unfortunately. Underneath Denver Airport. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I, like I said, you've done your homework, and it's just great to hear you on the air. Uh, I've never heard of you before, but Coast to Coast is great for bringing uh, new information to people. He, he is a first-time guest, but you know what, Stuart? I don't think you're going to be a last-time guest. I have a feeling you're going to come back. Well, I appreciate that. It's a fascinating program. Look, I, I owe you, too. You tell me about your books and where you can get them. Yes, my books are available at my website at expansions.com. And uh, you can also call uh, 269-429-8615 to order any books or consultations or DVDs. I do have DVDs on all of this information that we've talked about tonight and much more. Okay, very good. Let's go back to the phones. We'll go to our east of the Rockies line. You're on Coast to Coast. Hello there. Uh, good evening, George. Good evening, Stuart. How are you guys doing? Hi, fine. Good. This is John from Newark, Delaware. Um, you talked earlier about uh, that all of us humans here on this planet have 10 to 15% DNA, reptilian DNA. Yes, on an average. How did you get DNA since you have to have a reptilian and have to have their DNA to compare it to? How did you get it? Well, if you listened about how all human beings have reptilian DNA from the hybridization program in ancient times. Well, how did they get it is what I'm saying. You have to have a piece of their skin or saliva or something to get the DNA to compare it to. Oh, I see what you're saying, like a sample of the reptilian. Yes, well, you know, the reptilians have been interacting with the government for many, many decades. And so, yes, there is availability for getting that kind of uh, DNA. Um, there was even reptilians at the Dulce base at the Four Corners area in New Mexico, which, as you know, uh, there was an event there that uh, the aliens took back that base on their own. 
Um, there, there's many, many stories of battles that have occurred throughout uh, the Earth where reptilians have been killed and their DNA has been taken. Well, how come the whole world doesn't know this? Do you actually believe that you got DNA from the reptilians? I know that they have. Oh, uh, okay. I mean, it's, it's great entertainment for the show, but uh, personally, I think you're a complete whack. Well, you're entitled to your opinion, and I think that people who don't accept this are really in for a ride on themselves. Oh, I'll tell you what, Stuart. Uh, you know, the important thing of the information you're bringing out is that you at least make people think. Well, you know, George, I think that some of the material that people don't want to accept, they have fear issues. So they attack the messenger, and that makes them feel comfortable. Right. I, I, you know, I don't have any problems with people not believing what you're saying or they don't accept what you're saying. That, You know, the, the strength of this program is to take what our guest says without, uh, you know, major conflict in the comment and just, you know, make up our own minds. You know, I, I could sit back here and jump up and down or not. And I don't want to do that. Uh, I'd, I'd much rather people make up their own minds and decide if what they think they hear is correct or not. Well, I west, agree with that. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with us. Hi there. Yeah, hi. My name's Zach. I just wanted to say, hey, you know, I'm so glad you came on. I've been waiting for such a long time just to hear uh, this kind of topic um, on your show about mind control. I wanted to uh, get into a couple things specifically. You know, I've been trying to find out as much info as I could on a trauma-based mind control. Do they even do that so much anymore now that they have, you know, other types of things like microwave, you know, antennas and everything like that? And have you ever seen any of those trauma-based mind control rituals? Or what, what do you know about that? Yes. In fact, I have an entire DVD on that topic. Uh, true that they no longer need to take an individual in a so-called programming session to traumatize them, although that does occur from time to time still. They are able now with the new technology to directly transmit programming information into a human brain. And that is done, again, as I mentioned, from satellite transmission, cell tower transmission. And there's even ways of doing it through television, radio, and even through the wiring in your home where they can transmit certain frequencies that download into the brain. The, the biggest download basically occurs overnight when people are sleeping because that's the easiest time. There's no resistance. Uh, I have seen these trauma-based uh, incidences. I've, I've unfortunately had them happen to me uh, during the Montauk Project. Um, so, yes, uh, these things do occur, and you're correct that the new technology uh, now can circumvent most of the physical need for programming sessions. Let's go next to, well, we were not going to have time. I want, let me ask you this, though. Is You seem to have uh, hope that we're going to win this. Is yeah. that true? I think we have to. There's no question in my mind that we has to overcome this. And no one remains ignorant forever. Ultimately, people will say they've just had enough. And again, they kept the God mind within you. They can only make you think that you're not connected to God mind, but it is always there. And in my work, I help people to connect that, to realize that, and to utilize that. All right. Sounds like you have call waiting, by the way. I sent, uh, did you have another call coming in? I wasn't paying attention to it. <laughs> I Yeah, I heard you drop out for just a little bit. Uh, no, you cannot take the other call, Stuart. You're going to stay not. with me. <laughs> I know that. Well, we're going to come back. We're going to take more phone calls. Stuart, uh, do you get more? Do you get support when you talk about this topic, or do people kind of shun you? I'm getting mostly support. Of course, there's always people out there who don't want to hear this or to accept it. And again, I agree; it's their prerogative. And I, I don't force anyone to believe it. I state what I know, and you can accept or reject it. Um, however, rejecting it doesn't change what I know or what I experienced. But for the most part, I have these days a lot of acceptance and support in this work. Well, good for you. All right, well, stick with us. We'll be back in a moment. Uh, very quick night. We'll take your final phone calls on Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Norrie. Under some of these mind control programs, can somebody be deprogrammed? Absolutely. Well, that's one good thing. Do you have to do it through... Uh, 
through a specialist or what? Well, you have to know the techniques to download the the programming and undo it. And I have an entire uh, series of visualizations and exercises that I teach people and coach them through in order to do this. And uh, it is a long process. It's not going to happen in a couple of days or a couple of weeks. It takes years and years. In fact, I have been deprogramming since 1990, and I still have a bit to go as well. So no one should expect to have it done quickly. I feel that it can be done and it can be accomplished ultimately completely, but you need to be patient and consistent and persistent. Let's go back to final calls. West of the Rockies, where are you calling from? Hi there. Hi, this is Cindy calling from Cedar City, Utah. Hi, Cindy. And my question is, uh, what are crop circles? And I'll take my answer off the air. Uh, Stuart, you haven't brought up crop circles. Uh, do you want to talk about that? If sure. not, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'll talk. Sure, no problem. Take it away. Uh, you know, jokingly, I call them crap circles, and that is because they're not what people think they are. I happen to have known the person at Brookhaven National Labs who said that he helped create them. What they basically are are energetic injections into the morphogenetic grid of the earth to change life forms on the surface and even below. So what you're seeing are archetype symbols, what I call language of hyperspace that I teach, which are being put in in a sentence form to get a certain result so that if they want to change the genetics of a certain species or a group of an, or, or change something in an area, they will create these crop circles that go into the genetic grid there and then alter everything in the area. They're not uh, from Space Brothers. Okay, and also, you know, go to earthfiles.com if you also want to get another explanation on crop formations from Linda Moulton Howe. Let's go to our first time caller line. You're on with Stuart Swordlow. Hi there. Hello. Yes, take it away. Hey, this is Casey. Uh, I was, uh, was going to say, first of all, hello, George. Hi, right, Casey. And, uh, I have two quick questions for Stuart. Uh, the first being, uh, I guess, open to either one of you, is the reptilians that you guys are speaking of, is this uh, similar to the reptoids that have been spoken of in the past on this uh, program? And, yep. Uh, Number two question also, uh, Stuart was uh, claiming, he was talking about certain members of Congress, or I should say political members, uh, having lesions taken off of them, uh, being, I guess, uh, remnants of leftover reptilian skin. Uh, is he claiming, or I'm sorry, Stuart, could you claim that anyone, could you name a name I'm saying? Uh, in the United States, uh, political member. Uh, I guess that's kind of a not very clear question. Um, well, I'll just tell you, that, for example, Vice President Cheney had this done, and so did President Bush. That's exactly who I, uh, what came to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and as far as the first question, I honestly I don't know about uh, what was discussed on this program previously about reptoids, but I would imagine they're similar or the same. Very similar. Okay. Well, uh, that'll be all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Case. Thank you. Appreciate the you being part of the program. Let's see. Well, my machines are jammed up here, Stuart. So, let's go to our uh, pick a pick a card here, Stevie. Until I get my computer back up. East of the Rockies. You're on coast to coast. Hi. Hello there. Hi. This is Steve from Springfield, Mass. Hey, Steve. Hi. And uh, I have a question for the for the guest, and I'm not trying to attack the messenger. I keep my mind very open to all these subjects, but also I'm not the kind of person that buys the Brooklyn Bridge for a dollar right away either. And I'd like to know how uh, he explains the hard evidence that we have about history, like uh, the ge geological layers, the KT boundary all over the Earth, above which there's no dinosaur fossils found which is 65 million years old and uh you know it's a fascinating thing that he's talking about but i'm i'm just thinking about all these different all this different knowledge that i have some of which would require the cooperation of all kinds of geologists and scientists mm -hmm. and paleontologists and we're talking about 
a government whose secret agency can't even keep top secret anti-terrorist programs out of the New York Times. Uh, I, uh, I'm wondering about these things. All right, yes, that's a good I, question. Go ahead, Stuart. Mm-hmm. Yes, history, science, all of the publicly released information on those topics are basically sanctioned by the government. And in fact, history is written by the victors, as they say, and it's been rewritten uh, many times. And, you know, I had a client, uh, an elderly man from Tennessee, who remembered uh, years ago in the 1920s when he was in public school reading from his school book about Admiral Byrd's trip to the North Pole, where he found an entrance to the inner earth and uh, the tropical plants and the animals that existed there. And then he said one day that there were people from the Washington that came to the school and took all the books away and replaced them with different books that didn't have that information in it anymore. So as we go through time and as certain control systems are in place, different information is released to the public. There is also, there was something called Education 2000. That was a global um, education system where everyone in every country had to learn the same history, the same science, no matter where they lived. So there's a globalization of information, and the information has to be approved by the global government. So basically what I'm saying is that science information, uh, history information is written so that you understand things in a certain way, and very often it obliterates or covers up the truth. Anne from California says this program makes a lot of sense. Please ask Stuart why we seem to be acting like zombies all the time. Now, she's right about that. People seem brain dead. <laughs> I've been saying that a very long time. And, you know, again, it goes what I mentioned about creating a robotical society where everyone just performs their function without question. And not only that, they give, they want everyone to be on some kind of a pill, some medication that alters the way you think, alters the brain waves, and they enhance this with ELF that they bombard the earth with to make people go along with whatever it is that's, that's happening on the planet at the moment. So yes, people are zombies. They're becoming zombies, and um, um, I'm hoping to wake them up from their slumber. You're going to love this one. Please, George, no name, no city, no state. So I'm not going to. George, are you sitting down for this, Stuart, or are you standing? I'm sitting. All right. My niece is a Rothschild and was born with webbed feet. My spouse's sibling married into the family and explained that it wasn't a big deal, an anomaly that happens to the family once in a while. But I've always wondered. What do you think of that? Well, it makes perfect sense to me. There you go. Maybe yeah. proof, huh? Yes. That's yeah. it. That is weird. Okay, let's go back to the phones. Let's go to our West of the Rockies line. You're on with Stuart on Coast to Coast. Hi there. Yes, this is Greg Ryan. I've been a long-time listener, about 10 years. Well, though, thank you, Greg. Oh, sure. Uh, I was wondering how angels uh, would play into all this. Ah, yes. I actually write about this in my Healer's Handbook. And the, I call it an angelic hierarchy, which is part of our energetic structure, so that within our totality as a soul personality and as an oversoul, there are what I call angelic levels, which is really an energetic level, uh, which is um, on the higher path towards the God mind. So within each of us, is this ability to be angelic-like, and we can tap into that. And I actually teach exercises, visualizations, where we can tune in to the frequencies of the angelic hierarchy within each of us. Yes, I see. So I had an NDE, near-death experience, and it changed my life. <laughs> I believe I went before the God light, the God force, and it just uh, it was incredible. And I was told that love, we were here to learn to love, you know, Love is the answer, basically. Yes. So, yes. Um, so yes, unconditional love and acceptance is absolutely paramount to everything that exists. You've heard about Mothman, right? The Mothman story? Yes. M- might that have been a reptilian? No, that was actually a genetic uh, hybrid program that escaped from a base underneath West Virginia. Oh, you, no, you've got to tell me about that. 
Well, the government for many years has been creating what is called chimeras, which are uh, mixtures of species. They take genetics of one species, mix it with another. They do this in many locations, one of which was under a base in West Virginia. They also do it in Plum Island, which is off the coast of uh, Montauk and Long Island. Right. And they have been doing it in various locations in the western United States as well. And so, yes, the Mothman was nothing more than uh, one of these creatures that escaped from one of the um, holding pens. That's an incredible story. So where is Mothman now? Well, these creatures exist uh, in these places under the earth. Uh, they could be anywhere where they're holding these chimeras or experimenting with them. We're now seeing on the conventional media uh, stories where they're actually telling you about what they create, uh, mice with human ears, cows with human genetics. Uh, they're telling the, ca you the cat they're and rabbit chimera. You, yeah. You've heard about that, right? Well, you know, I don't know if those are, are valid or not, uh, but they have really mixed genetics of everything you can imagine, animals with insects, insects with humans, uh, you name it. And in fact, a lot of the plants that we consume are chimera because some of the corn, some of the other vegetables have human genetics in it and insect genetics in them. Okay, let's go to our east of the Rockies line. It's your turn. Hello there. Hi. Hi. Where, where are you calling from? Huh? I'm sorry, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Okay, go ahead. And there's a million questions I could ask, but if I can only ask one, it would be, is the general population that lives underground are they as unaware of us as we are of them, or do they all know about us? Okay. They, all, all population that is underground, and I am assuming that you're talking about the inner earth, not just underground bases. Right. Is, exactly. Sorry. Yeah. yeah they, they are aware of what's on the surface, absolutely, because they know that they live inside of the planet, and they know there is an outside of the planet. And this is part of their culture anyway. Wow. Well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, simple enough, and thank you very much as well. Let's go to our wild card line. Wild card three, you're on Coast to Coast. Hi there. Hi there. Yeah, go ahead, please. Well, he's gone. Let's go to our wild card two, you're on Coast to Coast. Hi. Hi, yeah, I'm here. This is Marie in New York City. Okay. Um, thank you for a great program. Um, I wanted to ask uh, two, two questions. First, there's supposed to be a big government mind control program in the mountains underneath Virginia Tech, and the, it's the Black Something Mountains. I can't think of the, whole, the right name, but the mountains underneath Virginia Tech is supposed to be a big government center that does mind control, and that would explain the, um, you know, the the whole thing that happened there. And also, um, the Pleiadians are they from this Lyrian the Lyrian system that you talked about? What was that name again, please? Ple the Pleiadians oh, from the Pleiadians, Pleiadian oh, okay. star system. Oh, I'll, I'll go to the first question. Uh, yes, you're absolutely correct. That area of Virginia is an NSA and CIA training ground, and Virginia Tech is a known recruitment center for that uh, those organizations. And that entire incident was an example of vigilante programming activation. And, and for your second question, Pleiadians, you know... That is a very big topic, uh, and sometimes when I talk about it, it upsets people who are involved in the New Age. But a lot of the information out there about Pleiadians is not exactly correct. It's government-sponsored information as a diversion. Yes, there are Pleiadian beings. However, they are not natural to that star system. The Pleiadian star system is actually younger than our own solar system, and no life evolved there naturally. It came, they are basically Lyrian refugees, and I think that might have been what you were asking. Yes, they were associated with the Lyrian system in some way. Yes, that is correct. They are, absolutely. Is that Lyrian system, is that a galaxy, or is that a, just a solar system within our galaxy? Oh, yeah, it's a solar system within our galaxy. Okay. Yeah. All right, okay. and he, thank nice. you so much for the deprogramming mission you're on, because people good, really good need a giant wake-up call. Thank you. Well, wake-up call indeed, Stuart, it is. And uh, 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 what kind of emails do you get after a program like this from people? Of course, well, this may be a first for you. I get hundreds per day anyway, but of course, after I do a radio show or a TV show, I get a lot of uh, uh 
emails from people who have had experiences and are looking for help and never knew that there was a place they could go to get it. Because, you know, you can't just go in the phone book and look up for a deprogrammer. That's something that, again, is uh, technically not allowed in this country because in order to allow deprogramming, they have to admit that programming exists. Good and point. First time caller line. Take it away. Hi. Uh, hello. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I have a, specifically, I have a question about, earlier you had mentioned uh, the Atlanteans. Yes. And how um, how they had um, how they had created uh, chimeras, and for example, you had mentioned the dolphin hybrids. Yes. Um, and uh, the connection with autistics. Um, and I was wondering if um, you had any illumination on the subject of werewolves in that vein. Yes, and in fact, uh, there, there actually are documented cases about werewolves, especially in Western Europe. These are leftover Atlantean experiments as well, where they, they mixed human genetics with wolf genetics uh, to create these hybrids who can shapeshift between. Uh, there are many famous cases of this in France and especially in Great Britain, uh, some of them as recently as the 1960s and 70s. So yes, these things do exist, and a lot of uh, uh, genetics in humanity that would be considered animalistic are throwbacks to those hybrid experiments in Atlantis. Oh, I'd love to get one of these 50-50 reptilians and, uh, and do some testing on them, Stuart, huh? Well, that would be interesting. I wonder if they would stand for it. Uh, probably not. No, I, I would agree. So they hear you on a program like this. Do they want to get to you? Oh, they always try to get to me one way or another. You know, my, my life isn't uh, easy or simple. And so we're always being attacked one way or another, whether it's, uh, you know, um, some kind of name-calling or uh, accusations. And, you know, if you Google my name, on a, I'm on about 12,000 different websites, and not all of them are friendly to me. Well, hey, that, that happens. I'm, I'm sometimes in the same boat. Stuart, thank you so much for a phenomenal program. You are considered a regular guest on Coast to Coast AM. Okay. For Steve Carr, Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Lottesor, Ross Mitchell, Alan Corbett, Stephanie Smith, Ian Punnett, and Mr. Art Bell, I'm George Norrie. Somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM, we shall see you on our next edition. Until then. Be safe, everyone.